Ezekiel chapter 34, beginning at verse 1, reading through verse 11. And the King James today reads in this fashion. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty, have ye ruled them? And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth and none did search or seek after them therefore ye shepherds hear the word of the Lord as I live saith the Lord God surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field because there was no shepherd Neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, I, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, listen, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep, and seek them out. Amen. I want to talk to us today for a while on the topic rancher, ranch hand, or both. Amen. Rancher, ranch hand, or both. If you'll bow your head with me, Lord, one more time, God, we come before you today. This has been an exceptionally trying and difficult week. Today, Lord, has been an exceptionally difficult and trying day as we try to get ready for church today, Lord. So many things wanting to go wrong, so many things wanting to happen, causing us, Master, today to have to rush around like lunatics trying to make everything ready and and this forcing me, Lord, not to even be able to stop and take time to eat. And Master, you know, my body struggles when my sugar drops. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost today more than I need the anointing ever. But you've given me a message, and in all the years, since 1993, when you called me to affirming ministry, I have done everything in my power to be a good shepherd, to feed the flock of God. I've tried everything in my power to be faithful to the pulpit. I've gotten up here to preach days after having my gallbladder removed, knowing that the people of God were counting on a word from the Lord. 
and that I must be faithful to my calling so that God's people could be fed. And Master, today is yet another day when things are difficult, times are trying, our minds, our emotions, our bodies are being taxed in ways they have never before been taxed. And yet, oh God, my desire, I promise you above all else, is to be faithful to the work that you have called me. I claim the promise of your word today. They that wait upon the Lord, they that do the Lord's bidding, shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings, like as eagles, they shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Touch us today, O oh God. Help me to deliver your word in a manner that will bring glory and honor to your name. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name today. Amen. Praise God and amen. A rancher is one who owns and operates a ranch. As much as a farmer is one who owns and operates a farm, but oftentimes in the case of farming, uh, the farmer is generally known to be very hands-on. You know, you don't have very many people who identify as farmers, and they own the land, and they own the the machinery and they own the cattle and the fields but uh, they're not out there working them. No, usually a farmer will be out there working his farm. But in the case of ranching where animals generally are tended to and kept, it is not always the case that the rancher actually engages in the ranching activities. He can own the land, he can own the barns, he can own the animals. But oftentimes the rancher will hire out men who are his ranch hands, and they're the ones who do the hands-on labor, the hands-on work of tending to the property and tending to the animals. God has called men and women, people, to a, an important office, and it is the office of shepherd, because his people are his sheep, and we are the sheep of his pasture. And God, in this instance, is more like a rancher in that he owns the sheep, he owns the barns, he owns the structures and the buildings and the land upon which the sheep graze and pasture. But he relies upon shepherds to do the hands-on work of tending to the sheep. It's funny, as I read this passage this week, as God was speaking to me concerning this message, it didn't even really hit me as it did now as I was reading this passage. At the start of our message, it really didn't even hit me how the description of the shepherds that we read in Ezekiel 34 today is so emblemic of what we see going on in the church today. God's shepherds are living high off the sheep. They're living large off the sheep. They're shearing the sheep. They're selling the wool. They're killing the sheep. They're eating their flesh. Oh, they're living the high life. But the sheep, what kind of leadership are they experiencing when they go astray does that ranch hand go after them does that ranch hand seek out those sheep that may have separated from the herd and somehow gotten lost and are not able to find their way home are they doing the work of a ranch hand are they doing the work of a shepherd 
I've been doing affirming ministry now for it'll be 30 years next year. And all these 30 years, I have struggled and I have striven and I have tried to do exactly that. I've tried to go to find those sheep that have lost their way. I've tried to find the sheep that have found themselves bound up in briars and bristles and thorns. I've tried to find those children of God who are backslidden, who may be part of the LGBT community, but they've lost themselves in alcoholism. They've lost themselves in drug use. They've lost themselves in sexual addiction. They've lost themselves in the subculture that is our society today, whether you be straight or gay, nightclubbing and partying and going to the bars. And that's the life. Well, if it's the life, then how come so many people who are living that life are miserable and unhappy? How come so many of us that are living that life are lonely and depressed and despondent so much of the time? I know what I'm talking about because I've lived at that address myself at one time. Tommy knows. He may be the only person on the planet who knows how hard I have struggled to go to every corner and every crevice and find people who are lost. Not people who have never belonged to God. Not people who have never known the Lord but people who, have, who are sheep of His pasture, who do belong in His fold, but they are out and about and they've lost their way. And I have struggled and striven now for near 30 years to do my best, to do what God has called me to do so that I might not be numbered among the shepherds who are not doing their job so that I might not be numbered among the ranch hands that are not doing their jobs. As the owner operator of a ranch, the rancher may own acreage, he may own many hundreds and even thousands or tens of thousands of acres of land, he may own scores of structures. He may own thousands of head of cattle or any number of a variety of assorted livestock. A rancher may or may not be hands-on in the actual running of his ranch. He may have a number of employees who oversee the farming and the animal care so that he seldom, if ever, has to physically do the work of ranching. Well, I want to tell you today, according to the promise of Ezekiel 34, 1 through 11, our God ended his rebuke of the shepherds who were not doing the work that he had called them to do. He ended his rebuke by making the promise, listen to me children, that he himself would come and he himself would do the work of searching out the sheep and seeking them out. Did he not? Amen. In verse 11 the Lord said, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. In Jeremiah 31 and verse 10, the Lord is recorded as saying, Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattereth Israel will gather him and keep him, as the shepherd doth his flock. So God himself has promised 
to do the work of reconciliation and to do the work of restoration that is necessary because the shepherds have not done their job. The ranch hands have not done their job. Therefore, the rancher promised that he himself would do what was necessary to find those that were lost and to help those that were sick and those that were wounded and those that were in despair to help them find their way back to the fold of safety. In John chapter 10 verses 11 through 16, Jesus is recorded as saying, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, meaning one who is hired to perform the duties of a shepherd, he said, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sh the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, listen, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. It's important today to notice and to understand that Jesus identifies himself, listen children, not only as a ranch hand, but he identifies himself as the rancher. Hallelujah. He said, I've come for my sheep. Oh, glory to God. God didn't make Michael the archangel into a savior and put him on planet earth. He would have been a hireling. But Jesus said, I am not a hireling. I am the shepherd. Glory to God. I am the rancher. Bless the name of the Lord. I said the rancher would come and do the work that the ranch hands had failed to do. Oh, bless the Lord. And here I am, the rancher. Glory. I own these sheep. They're my sheep. The reason I'm willing to go to the cross for them and die for them is because I am not a hired hand, but I am the rancher. Glory to the name of the Lord. God, my friend, the Word of God teaches us, is a spirit. God, a spirit, manifested himself in human form. In that human form, he is called the Son of God. Why is he called the Son of God? He is called the Son of God because uh, identified as a man, he is a man who knows no father but God. He knows no father but the Spirit of God. He claims to have had no physical earthly father. Therefore, in the flesh, as a man, he is called the Son of God. Thus the form occupied by the Father was called the Son. And yet, he was at the same time very much the Father. 
The Word of God tells us in Old, Pro Old Testament prophecy, speaking of Messiah, the Christ, it, the Word of God declares, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus spoke those words. In John chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus spoke the words, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, listen, which is in the bosom of the Father, which is in the bosom. The author of John, John, the author of the gospel as recorded by John, is writing these words. And he says, the only begotten Son, which is is in the bosom of the Father. Present tense. He didn't say which was in the bosom or which will be in the bosom. He said the only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. The term declared translated from a Greek word that means to reveal or to unveil. You see, the Son, the Bible said in the beginning was the Word, which is a plan, a spoken thought, an express thought, an express plan, or an idea. In the beginning, God had a plan. And the plan was with God, and the plan was God. The Son was in the bosom, in the heart of the Father from the get-go. Oh, glory to God. God had the thought. He had the plan. He had the intention of creating a man who would walk among us, who would be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted, the angel said, is God. That plan was in his bosom. It was in his breast from the beginning of time. Which is why when you get into the book of Revelation, you see the lamb represented before the throne of God. You see this image of a lamb. And yet, in the end, the Lamb steps into the throne. Hallelujah. He steps into the throne of God. And all of a sudden, the throne becomes what is referred to as the throne of God and of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Because there is, and yet the Word of God tells us plainly that in heaven, in the book of Revelation, it said there is one throne and one sat upon that throne. Why? Because the one sitting in the throne is the Spirit. And that Spirit became the Lamb. And the Lamb one day will merge once again with the Spirit. Hallelujah. Because, honey, the rancher and the ranch hand are one. They're one and the same. God promised that He would come. That the rancher would come. He said, I'm not going to leave the work of seeking out my sheep to hired hands. He said, I'm going to come and I'm going to do this work myself in Ezekiel 34, 1 through 11, as well as in Jeremiah 31 and verse 10. He promises that he himself will come and do this work. In 1 Timothy 3, 16, the word of God declares... And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. The term godliness means literally all that pertains to God. And then the writer Paul says, God was manifest in the flesh. Why do we apostolics not employ the traditional Trinitarian language that God is three persons because trying to identify God as a person is idiotic and stupid, never mind trying to make him three people. Mm -hmm. 
God cannot be. You cannot describe God in terms of personage, in terms of person. That is insane. We use the language that God is manifest as the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And according to the Word of God, these three are one. Not in unity, but in quantity. The same one that is called Father is also called Son. The same one that is called Son is also called the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The Bible tells us, for by one Spirit are ye all baptized baptized into one body the word of God tells us that as many as have received him gave he the power to become the sons of God the word of God said but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you it is not different the Father and the Son the Holy Ghost is not different than the Son nor the Father hallelujah they are Manifestations of one singular God. Now, people can watch ghost shows every day on television, and they can understand the concept, Tommy, of a human being spirit being separated from their body and their body being lowered into a grave, and they can accept the thought that that ghost, that spirit appears to loved ones apart from the body, apart from the graveyard, apart from where it's been interred. They can accept that they can understand it, but they can't understand that God can be three manifestations of one singular God. Doesn't make them three people. <clears throat> Not at all. No, man is body, soul, and spirit, according to the Word of God. Those are three aspects of one human being. If you take the soul of the man, the spirit of the man, and the body of the man, and you stand them all side by side, you have one man. Mm -hmm. You don't have three different people. You have one man. But you have three different unique manifestations of that man. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. That's the simple reality of God. That's the simple reality of God. The Father, that is a title that is reserved for God manifest as the Creator. The Son is the title reserved for God manifest in human form as the Redeemer. The Holy Ghost is God manifest in spiritual form specifically for the purpose of interaction within the church and uh, uh, as the bringer of new life for the Regenerator. In Philippians 2, 5-8, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What happened to Lucifer when Lucifer made himself equal to God. He was cast out of heaven. How then could Jesus think it not robbery to be equal with God if he's not God? But it said, being in the form of God, thought it not so. In other words, while he was yet manifested as the Father, as God, he thought it not robbery. I could go to earth and be God. I could go to earth as the Father. Wouldn't kill anything, wouldn't hurt anything, because that's who I am. But, I've said it so many times, the word but is the biggest word in the Bible. But made himself of no reputation. Oh my God. 
No, Jehovah did not make him of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation and took upon himself, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Folks, how hard is this? And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I'm here to tell you today, the shepherd, excuse me, the rancher became the ranch hand. It's not rancher, ranch hand, separate, no. The rancher and the ranch hand are one. Jesus, the Lord our God, is both. Hallelujah. He is both the shepherd and he is at the same time the owner of the sheep. Glory to God. In John 14, 6 through 11, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Why? Because God is a spirit. It's not about a different person. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? <laughs> Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. See, I don't have to add a lot of commentary to all this. If you can't understand what I'm reading, then <laughs> there's something wrong with your head. Listen. Let's try to understand this at a practical level. When a spirit seeks to do something in the natural world, all these paranormal supernatural experts will tell you that in order to do something in the natural world, it must occupy a body. The individual it occupies can have an identity all their own, aside from the spirit that occupies them. Am I telling the truth? So, Jane has the spirit of a man named John slip into her body, according to all these experts. All of a sudden now we're talking to Jane, but we're not talking to Jane because now we're talking to John. Yet, is Jane present? Yes, Jane's there. Do you hear what I'm telling you? This isn't hard to understand. So when the father stepped into a body, the body is called the son. The man is called the son. But does that mean the father's not there? No. Jesus, and every work I do, every word I speak comes from the father that is in me. So understand who I am, Philip. Understand that I and my father are one for the very work's sake. So the individual occupying that body can have an identity as well as the person being occupied. But by the same token, the spirit occupying the body also now shares identification with the body. John chapter 6, 45 and 46, it is written in the prophets, 
and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me, Jesus said. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Well, we know according to God, he told Moses, Moses, you couldn't see me if you wanted to. Because if you were to lay eyes on me, your physical human form would drop dead. God is a spirit. The only flesh that had the ability to look upon the Spirit of God would be flesh that was occupied by the Spirit of God. When you're talking about a little tiny man that amounts to not even the size of an ant compared to the greatness of God who declares the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, all God had to do in a sense was put his finger in the man Jesus Christ, if you follow my imagery. He was a little finger puppet, okay? But God was in Christ, the word of the Lord said, reconciling the world unto himself. But he was both the Father in spirit and the Son, which is why the Apostle Paul told us in our earlier text, 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Listen, justified in the spirit. What does that mean? It means literally he was perfect in spirit. Well, how is that possible if he was a human being, if he was, if he was a creation of God? No. No, he was God. His spirit was that of God. Therefore, his spirit was perfect. There was not one ounce of sin in his spirit. Oh my goodness. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Who was? God was. God was manifested in the flesh. <clears throat> God was justified in the spirit. God was seen of angels. God was preached unto the Gentiles. God was received on in the world. And God was received up into glory. Who are we describing? The man Jesus Christ. The rancher became the ranch hand. In John chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, then I'm going to skip down to verses 10 through 11 only for the sake of time today. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Anything made that was made. He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own. The rancher came to His sheep, hallelujah, and His own received Him not. So God himself promised to come as a shepherd and reunite to seek out his sheep. Jesus Christ claimed to be the good shepherd, claiming the sheep as his own rather than merely claiming to being a hireling or a hired hand. In Ezekiel 34, verses 12 through 24, same chapter as our primary text, but now we're going to go the next section beyond what we read earlier. As the shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places 
beasts of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture, and shall a, a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. And as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he-goats. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, and to have drunk of the deep waters, but ye must foul the residue with your feet. And as for my flock, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which ye have fouled with your feet. Therefore, uh, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle, because ye have thrust with side and with shoulder, and pushed all the diseased with your horns, till ye have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey. And I will judge between cattle and cattle, and I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. In this passage, the Lord identifies as a God who will establish a prince who will do what? Who will dwell among us. The body occupied by the Spirit, known to us as the Son of God, is here called the Prince. Isn't that funny? His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. What? The Prince of Peace. Why did that prophecy use the term Prince of Peace? Because God had promised the Prince here. What was the prince going to be? The shepherd who was going to dwell among them. Mm -hmm. But who was the shepherd that was going to dwell among us be? But God himself. Hallelujah. The prince is identified as David. But David is long since dead, even when this prophecy was made. So the Lord is using the term David in reference to David's throne. And yet it is God himself who promised to sit in David's throne as a prince among us. The rancher lending his hand to the work of ranching rather than leaving the work to hired hands. Psalm 132.11 The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David he will not turn from it of the fruit of thy body will I sit upon thy throne. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, <clears throat> meaning basically, in other words, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and he hath and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation 
In John chapter 14, verses 15 through 23, Jesus is recorded as having said, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, meaning the flesh, the man, will pray the Spirit, or, or ask of the Spirit, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you how long forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him. But ye know Him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Is it a change of person? No, it's a change of manifestation. Instead of dwelling with us, he will now dwell in us. Jesus said, verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, I, excuse me, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Hallelujah. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Again, the word manifest, manifest myself to him. Jesus saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So we have the Savior, the person of Jesus Christ, but with him comes the Father, with him comes Almighty God. Second John chapter 9, uh, excuse me, Second John verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. See, this is where people get all confused about the language that's used in the King James translation when the Lord says, we will come and make our abode with him. If you believe in God the Father, for instance, as the Jews do, or as the Muslims do, but you don't embrace Jesus Christ as the physical manifestation of God, the Son of God, then according to the Word of God, you don't have the Son. What's the Son? The Son is the manifestation of God that came to bring salvation. You don't have salvation. You don't have the Son. But if you have the Son, you automatically have the Father. Do you see? Do you see? This is why the Lord used the language, we will make our abode with Him. He's trying to express that with me comes the Father. Hallelujah. Anytime you accept the Son, anytime you receive the Son, anytime you believe on the Son, you automatically are receiving and are believing on the Father as well. Because I and my Father are one. We're one and the same. The rancher became the ranch hand. John chapter 10, almost done today. John chapter 10, verses 24 through 33. Listen. Then came the Jews round about him, meaning about Jesus, and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, 
they bear witness of me. Remember what he said earlier. He said, everything I do is the Father doing it through me. So in this, in this passage, he uses the term in my Father's name. He said, the works that I do in my Father's name, uh, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. Now wait now, are these God's sheep or are these Jesus' sheep? Which one is it? Well, Jesus had better be God if he's claiming the sheep as his own. He said, but because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So he's saying on one hand, he said, listen, anybody in my hand, ain't nobody going to pluck them out. But since you guys don't seem to understand who I am, well then let's look at it from a bigger perspective. God, who certainly is bigger and greater than a man standing in front of you right now, you ain't going to be able to pluck him out of his hand. And I got a word for you. I got a little revelation for you. I got something you need to understand. I and my Father are one. Hallelujah. <laughs> my Lord, have mercy. Then the Jews, listen, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, Listen, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. The Jews understood good and well exactly who Jesus claimed to be. Mm -hmm. Notice they didn't say you make yourself to be the Son of God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no. They said, but thou being a man, makest thyself God. Well, the whole definition of Son of God is God manifest as a man. I've asked dozens and dozens and dozens of Jewish rabbis and Hasidic Jewish men over the years. I lived in New York City for 10 years, and I used to enjoy asking Hasidic Jews, because they're the most devout and the most religious. Now, I've asked other Jews as well. And I would say to them, listen, I'm not asking this question for to argue. I'm not asking this question to convert you. This is not an effort on my part to, you know, get into a debate. I'm asking as a, a theologian, I want to understand the Jewish perspective. Who did Jesus Christ claim to be? Not one time out of the dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of men that I asked, not one time did the answer ever change. It always came back, God. See, the Jews understand that Jesus claimed to be the rancher. The Jews have no thought in the universe that Jesus Christ claimed to be a ranch hand. That he was somebody God sent to do something on his behalf. No, they understood exactly who Jesus claimed to be. He claimed to be the shepherd. And there's not but one shepherd. And the shepherd is God. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Hallelujah. I shall not want. Glory to God. In 1 John 2, 20-23, my final passage today. 
This went fairly well, all things considered. Thank God for the anointing. 1 John 2, 20-23 But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. Now the Christ, according to Old Testament prophecy, was God's promise to himself come to save Israel and to be Israel's Savior. He said, John says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is the anointed one. He is the promised one. He is the prophesied one. He said, He is the Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Listen, here comes that important understanding. The Trinitarian doctrine said God is three people, but that these three people are all magically one, you know, one Godhead, which no matter how you slice it, is a committee of three, folks. But listen, he said, He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son the same hath not the Father. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father. How? But by me. You cannot even begin to know God the Father except you come through Jesus Christ. Why? Because I and my Father are one. The whole reason he came, the whole reason the rancher became the ranch hand is so that we could know him and we could see him and we could talk to him and we could learn from him. All people will be taught of God. God himself came. God himself taught. God himself rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees. Oh my goodness. God himself lifted up the downtrodden. God himself encouraged those who others had condemned and criticized and cast aside. God himself did exactly what God himself said he was going to do when he said, I'm going to come and I'm going to be the shepherd that seeks out. I'm going to be the one to restore. I'm going to be the one to bring healing. And then what did he do? The word of God said not only did he perform the work of restoration and reconciliation but then he gave every believer every child of God the responsibility of carrying on that work we're supposed to be doing the same thing that the Lord himself came to do oh hallelujah whosoever denieth the son the same hath not the father he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. So the minute you acknowledge the Son, and the minute you acknowledge Jesus, and you believe on Jesus, honey, you have found God. Hallelujah. <laughs> you have found the Father. Oh, glory to God. Why? Because it's the question today, rancher, ranch hand, or both? It's both. Hallelujah. He is both the rancher who became the ranch hand. Hallelujah. He is the good shepherd. Glory to God. Every once in a while, we apostolic folks need a reminder of this great truth that we embrace today as one God, Jesus name people. Our God is one. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you stand with me.